a little backstory. Uh, July 4th is when I usually start pulling my honey. And um, this year was actually one of my best years yet. I got um, 1,200 pounds of honey from 50 supers. Wow. And that is basically 24 uh, five gallon buckets of honey. So what I do is after I have those sticky frames, See, personally, I'm always raising queens, so I have like 40 mating nukes out in the yard. So I take those queens, put them into 10 frame equipment with a couple frames from the mating nuke on, in the sticky frames to build them up for winter. So that's basically after July. So from that, um, I will start feeding uh, a little bit, you know, and I use um, frame feeders. So I run all medium boxes. So pretty much all my hives are in three medium boxes. And um, I usually just use the frame feeders without the tops or the ladders or anything like that. And I actually heard from someone just the other day that they put a piece of uh, plastic foundation in the open frame feeder. And that's a way for the bees to climb out so they don't drown in there. Usually what I get is they'll draw a piece of comb in there. And then I just use that. I just fill it up. And that, they just use that as a ladder to come in. Um, so I usually, I don't feed them, you know, you just kind of give them a little bit to get them started, keep them from getting too cranky, you know, when you, uh, go into the hives and stuff. And then, um, I only treat with oxalic acid vapor. So starting in August, I start, I'll treat my hives every weekend for two or three weekends just to try to get a full brood cycle so that the bees can be, you know, low mites, so they can start their winter bees um, and stuff like that. And I just wanted to say, when I mix my syrup, I just do two gallons of boiling water and then three 10 pound bags of sugar and mix it in a five gallon bucket. And that's usually, that's about two to one. I mean, you guys, you know, the bees don't really care. They'll just, they just want something, you know, because otherwise they, there's not really much for them to put in the comb. Um, and I would say one of the things you need to make sure of is to keep the inspection short. I try to keep my inspections under two minutes where you basically just go, you take the lid, you, just, you look for between the frames, you look for a lot of bees between a seam, you know, between two frames, you, you pull that one out. If you don't see the queen or brood, you can go down to the next box and you just do that. So you're just basically trying to see brood. You're trying to see a little bit of honey in there or something for them to do. And um, if you left a lot of honey, then just make sure they still got a little room to mess around or lay eggs and stuff. Um, and then after that, um, for September, I start feeding like, that's when I feed like crazy, um, usually a couple weeks into September. I want to be done feeding by Halloween because usually the nights are too cold. And the bees will stop taking the syrup anyway. So the Halloween done by done feeding by Halloween is my my cutoff. Um, and then I would say after that, I'm just you know you can you know you don't have to peek into hives to see if they have um, enough stores. You can kind of lift them and feel it. So I do a lot of that, um, and then I'll do oxalic vapor once a month starting in january on not freezing cold days because you want the vapor to get into the cluster you know if their cluster too tight it just it's not going to penetrate um so then yeah that's really it and then i guess for tips for summer beekeeping is just keep it short because you know you can start robbing so fast just by opening up a hive and the bees you know they'll smell that and also, I try not to keep, like I have all those mating nukes that I put into 10 grain pies. I try to keep all of those in one apiary because I find that if I mix nukes and full-size hive production hives, that the production hives will pick on the nukes just because there's, you know, they're not strong enough to defend themselves and they will just be relentless picking on them until they get in and rob them out and stuff. So I try to keep them in different apiaries so at least there's a little distance between them. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't have to be miles away just not next door to one another to kind of set up a little bit of a boundary um and then i actually have one of those um it's like a little like cooling neck band that you can soak in water and it has beads that absorb water i'll put that around my neck sometimes if you're in there and it's just beyond blazing hot because it's 
it does get pretty terrible. I mean, Carly has a little fan that she wears, but um, <laughs> it gets pretty noisy, and she can't really hear me when I'm saying stuff here, so she she doesn't always have it on. But um, yeah, that's my basically my regimen. I don't really I try not to get into the hives as much as possible, and I'm just I'm doing as much as I can from the outside. You know, lifting them to feel the weight. And then if I they need feed, I go in really fast and just put feed in. And I when I do feed, I try to do it like at the end of the day, maybe right before dark, um, you know, just so that if I do spill some or if the bees do get a little worked up and try to start robbing, that, that they all end up, the sun goes down and then they all go home. And hopefully in the morning, you know, they don't start robbing right away. So that's basically my summer and fall leading up winter prep routine um and other than have any questions how how often are you um oxalic acid vaping vaping them at this time of the year just once after you every, i do every week for about three weeks okay so every weekend i'll go out and i'll, I'll hit every hive i have one of those little pro vaps so it's really sweet it's like the well batteries so i can just go right down the line and hit them all and then um yeah i feel like i, I know a lot of people use amitraz and i just personally i hate picking those things out in the spring because i feel like they're always you always forget about them they're always like oh yeah this thing's still in here so i personally just don't like that so i just stick with the oxalic paper and it's been working pretty well for me you know not gonna work so so you have an instavate yeah probate i mean yeah instavat in yeah. instavat yeah, okay. I really like it. I mean, it was not cheap, but it is, the plunger alone is worth the money because you can, you know, I have a little mason jar now of oxalic acid and I put the thing in, plunge it in, fill it up, put it in, put, you know, put the unit in the hole in the entrance and put the plunger in there and just press it. And then it just, you know, starts blazing and you can watch the temperature will drop like 50 degrees and then it will come right back up and then it's done and then it's moved down to the next one. So I'm, you know, it's maybe 45 seconds per hive, and I'm just going right down the line. And sometimes I'll put a towel over the entrance when I leave, you know, to keep the vapor and the bees in. But usually I don't really get a lot of vapor, um, you know, creeping out of the entrance or cracks in the hives and stuff. So I just keep You keep were saying the line. when you took your honey supers off, you put them back on the hive or you let them clean them out? I, I put them on the hive, well, I put them on the nukes. So I put the nukes in the stickies because I run all mediums. So I'm constantly expanding. So, you know, like before I did that, I had something like 70 hives and now I have 110. You know what I mean? So it's just like, that's just so how So you're I giving eat. them the sticky so they got food. Well, and yeah, so they got, they got a little bit of food, they got drawn combs so they can just start laying it, and then I start mm -hmm. feeding them to give them even more food and make sure they keep laying to build up strength. And then next it. year you'll get your your production hives to draw the comb out for your honey supers? Exactly. Every year I'm just putting fresh foundation on and letting them draw it out, and then I'm just doing that again and again. And the goal is to get up to about two or 400 hives, and then I'll probably just start reusing the same supers. So, but I feel like we, I probably got about three or four years before I get to that level. So for now, I'm just, every comb that I have is going back on the hives to help them build up for winter. Okay. So if, so if I were to pull my supers, extract them in the next week, would I put them back, the, the super with the stickies, back on those hives and let them clean them up and do whatever? So... I would say yes, but the only caveat to that is they have enough bees that they can patrol that comb because the small hive beetles will get bad this time of year. So if you have a hive that's not big enough, and I have that too, like some of my hives I'll see and I'm like, oh, you know, the beetles are getting bad and I'll take a box off to try to keep them small because they need enough bees to patrol that area where the small hive beetles will take over so fast. It's, I mean, it, you know, it just takes a few days and they'll have worms in there and then it's once the honey slime, the bees don't touch it, and you almost have to take the frame out with the slimy honey and dunk it in water to rinse it off and then put it back in because otherwise the bees, just, they'll, they'll avoid those slimy frames. It's, it's pretty nasty. Yeah. Sometimes I'll just take them um, and just crisscross the boxes 
you know, out in the yard and let, let the rain wash them out, let the bees rot it out that way. So, but that, you know, I'm, I got a lot of hives, so. When, when do you re start reducing your hives down and you run three mediums through the winter? Uh, yeah, I'll do two or two, medi two or three mediums through the winter, depending on the, the hive strength now in the fall. So if some of them aren't big enough to fill three mediums, I'll do two mediums and then just let them, you know, just so they have enough bees. So there's bees on every frame. That's why when I want, when I look down into the hive, I want, I don't want there just to be a few bees in between a few frames in a super. You know, that's not enough bees for me. So I'll take that box off and make sure they're kind of crowded because, you know, I mean, without a flow, they're not really going to swarm that much. I mean, and even if they did swarm, I, I, they're not going to, they're not going to swarm a lot. There's going to be like one little swarm and that's going to be it. And more than likely what they're going to do is they're going to try to draw out a queen cell and then they're going to realize it's not a flow and they're just going to tear it down as long as the queen's got to be left. Or even, you know, as long as she's got eggs in there, they're not going to, I haven't. I mean, no, if it's if it's a slimed out hive, they'll abscond, they'll leave. But as long as they, it's not, you know, taken over by small molecules. And, and I have one other question that's really gross. Okay. okay. Um, the first year, I thought I was going to collect honey. I had a huge small hive beetle problem, and I opened the the honey super, and it was just total. The whole thing was slimed, and I think you came over and helped. You know, you said now nope, just ditch it, put it out in the field, you know, let them clean it out. I saw on Facebook, someone said, oh no, go ahead and extract it. It's good. And that kind of turned my stomach. Would you do that? No. No, okay. I mean, I, and that's the other thing. When I harvest honey, I only harvest as many frames as I can extract in the next day or two. Because if you have frames sitting in the honey house for more than three days, the worms will start in that too, the small hive beetle. You know, you have to assume the small hive beetle eggs are everywhere. Right. And the moment there's not bees on those frames, the eggs are gonna hatch and they'll turn into worms. So I just yeah, I I avoid that honey at all costs. Yeah. Like if I see a frame that's been sitting in the honey house too long, I will take it and put it right outside and just say, not even worth it. Because, you know, the small hive beetle larvae have that yeast in their mouth and that's what makes the honey ferment. And I mean if that got into your whole batch of honey, I gotta yeah. imagine that would kill the whole thing. I mean, I just ferment the whole batch down. I mean, I have seen, I will get some beetles every once in a while, but once they hit the honey, they usually drown and then they filter out. So it's not like, you know, they're in the honey, but right. you know, I feel like, you know, the yeast doesn't have time to set up with, with that. But the mm -hmm. worms, that's gross. That's right. just, oh. The, the only way the yeast will have any effect is if the moisture is higher in content. That's what happens when the worms get in. They chew through the cappings, and the, the honey draws moisture to it. Okay. And that's when the sliming occurs because not only a yeast of the enzymes that they put into the honey is they're chewing through it. Well, after what I saw, that, that just turned my stomach when I thought somebody was going to do that. I didn't correct them. I thought, well, to each his own, but, oh, that made me sick. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I heard the jars blowing up. Yeah. Now, you say you're going to harvest some honey, man. Now, what are you running, two deeps? Oh, a brew chamber? No. I've got mostly mediums. I have, I have two, I have one hive, two hives that have deeps, one deep, and then mediums. And then mm -hmm. I have one hive that is all mediums, and I have five supers on them right now. And, I mean, she's just filling the damn thing up. I mean, just rocking it. So. But you're, yeah, but you're, you know, you are got to flow. Yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, as far as your winter, you know, do you, you know, your winter configuration would be either three mediums or a deep and a medium. Well, that's two, what I, that's what I was asking. That's what I was asking. And, and then after you get done extracting your honey out of your honey supers, I usually just, I, I don't put them next to the hive. I put them, I don't know, a thousand yards, you know, from my house to the back of the barn is, uh, you know, a thousand feet or something like that, or at well, least 500. And they'll come and, you know, rob it out in a couple hours and fly back to the hive and you can kind of tell when they're done. 
Well, the, re the reason I was asking is, can I put them back on the hives and let them clean the stickies out? I have, I have the entrance reducer, the robbing frames, and it, we're just down to the little opening at the top. It is because, some of you may know, I have a very wily groundhog who has a target on his head, but <laughs> I haven't been able to catch him yet. Um, and he, he likes, he likes to eat my drawn comb. He likes to eat my sticky wooden frames and he's just making my life miserable. So I don't want to, I found this out when I was setting the frames out for the bees to clean them up away from the apiary. And I'd go back in the afternoon to pick them up and they were all knocked over and he'd been sitting on them and chewing on them and God only knows what else. So that's why I wanted to put them back on the, the hives to protect them. Well, you're putting them back on the hive, but that also gives a spot for the hive beetles to get into and lay eggs in like crazy. In, uh, into a sticky to, frame. Yeah. To me, I would say do your extracting and along like 2 o'clock and 1, 2 o'clock in the afternoon, set them out cross stack, and by dark, they'll be clean. Okay. And you can put them in and stack them inside a building somewhere where to or up where the groundhog can't get to them. Okay. Or just stick them in the freezer till next spring and put them in the hives. Yeah, that's what I have. That's what I have. Yeah. Days to do that, have fun. <laughs> All mine are in the freezers. Yeah. Okay. All right. And, and I, I have to say, I, I had a group of them in the freezer. I looked down at the bottom and there was a, I, I don't know, a worm, whether it was wax malt or whatever it was, but the coldness was driving and of course I finished it off with a stick you know well I had I had my my frames in the freezer that had wax moths and probably small high beetles and whatever then the power went off for three days and I opened the freezer and all the worms were laying on the bottom of the freezer so I'm like okay now I gotta clean the freezer out <laughs> but it killed them it killed them all <laughs> Well, the boxes weren't any the worse for wear. No, that's true. <laughs> that's true. That's true. Okay. Any other questions for Brian? Don't be bashful. <laughs> okay. I'll ask, I'll ask him how much AMC he's putting in, but I'll, I'll ask him that later. Say, <laughs> say that again? I'll ask him how many, how much acid he's putting in his vaporizer, but I'll ask him that later. Okay. Right. Right. No, I'm tell the truth, four grams. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Look, wait, I don't know what I think it is, but I think I'm at like two or three grams. I'm at the, the third notch on the plunger, so. Per okay. high. Yeah, yeah, so. it does have a graduation thing on there. Yeah. So yeah. I have it all the way up, but I have it at the third notch, so I just keep on that. <laughs> And, and, oh, pretty good. and for us, us small town beekeepers who maybe just have the, um, the wand, you know, the, whatever you call that thing. Yeah, the pain. Yeah. yeah. Um, or maybe just dribble or whatever. Are both of those okay? I mean. Yeah, the dribble's good, but it, it takes a little bit of time to do it. And, you know, usually you mix it with sugar syrup, so. It might create robbing. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, like if you don't have the. Actually, like I said, the hammer trash works really well. I mean, I'm not, I don't, like I said, I don't use it anymore, but that's what I used to and everyone else I know still uses this time of year because it gets under the cat base. So. How, how about the Apigard or what is it? Um, I don't yeah. think that's working anymore, is it? How about the... You, no, you're right? talking about April Bar. Um, April Bar. Amitraz okay. is, is April Bar. Okay. okay. And What's the plastic? Huh? The plastic strip. That's little... April. That's April Bar. April Bar. Right. And that's Amatraz. Okay. All right. Hold on one second here. And then there's April Guard. This is this is um, Lloyd's. Oops. Oh yeah, nice. I forgot about. This Wait thing. a minute. I don't know. Can you see it? Okay. Now it is. Yeah. Now we can see it. Okay. This is Lloyd's um, chart. Um. Yeah, April Bar. So Lloyd, do you wanna you wanna talk about any of these? No. Well, 
Uh, they all work. Uh, probably the hardest one to use is Ava Life Bar because it's like breaking up graham crackers and putting in on the frames. <laughs> uh, and it takes multiple treatments. Uh, and it's fairly expensive. The active ingredient is thymol. You can get the same thing with Ava Guard, where you can buy it either in the tub and you have a syringe to push the uh, gel out on a aluminum foil card, or you can buy the small trays and it takes two trays to treat a colony. Um, the Formic, part of the issues with Formic Pro, and it is a very viable treatment, but uh, is the temperature issue. Uh, it supposedly is 84 degrees for the max temperature. If you can get three or four days in a row where it's below 84 degrees, if it gets above that, it's not bad for the bees or not as bad for the bees because the first three to four days is when the majority of the treatment goes out of the pad. So that's when they're actually fumigating in under the cell caps for cap brood. Uh, that's when that occurs. After that, it's exposed bees or, or uh, bees are, I'm sorry, not exposed bees, exposed mites that are out, phoretic mites. Uh, hop guard is still a decent treatment. There's no temperature restraints on it. And the apobar is a viable treatment and there's no temperature requirements on that. Uh, oxalic acid. I know it says load two grams of crystals into a cool vaporizer. Uh, it's not official, but basically the current recommendation, not authorized, is two grams per hive body. So if you have two hive bodies on, they use four grams. Uh, if you're doing three mediums, I would say you could use three grams anyway, maybe four. Um, people have treated with as high as seven or eight grams and it doesn't seem to have any effect on the bees. Uh, all of these require that the supers be removed except for Formic Pro and HopGuard. Those could be put on with the supers on. Uh, I don't know. I guess if you had a really bad infestation and you still had a honey flow on, you could treat, but Typically, I I wouldn't use any of these products with a hun with honey supers on myself. That's just me. Uh, the manufacturers and the EPA says you can use the treatment with supers on though. Uh, the dribble method, as Brian said, is it's a viable treatment, but the issues that you have is you have to mix it with sugar syrup. The treatment the the, what you mix and you have doesn't store too long very well. Um, probably the main other main thing with these is with the Formic Pro and the uh, vaporization. It is, especially with the oxalic acid vapor, you need to have a particle respirator. You can get them at Home Depot with a AP100 cartridge on it. Uh, you would need the same thing for the Formic Pro and AP100 cartridge will do. Uh, and that's to keep from breathing in the vapor. Uh, OA with the, the vaporization, you get a whiff of that, you're gonna be half coughing and hacking and wheezing. If you get a bad enough shot, you can burn your throat or your your lungs. Oh, wow. Um, so if you're gonna use vaporization, you definitely need to use a vaporizer or a, I'm sorry, a uh, mask. Uh, that is the fact that you liquid, you've taken the crystals, you've broken it down into the gaseous liquid stage. And as soon as it cools, it goes back to a crystal. And basically when you see, when you say vapor, what you're seeing, the white cloud you're seeing are actually ultra fine crystals of oxalic acid. And that's what you don't want to breathe. If you can 
manage to stay upwind all the time. You don't need a vapor mask or a, a particulate mask, but they're not that much money. And uh, that would be the one I would use it for the most. It doesn't hurt to have one for Formic Pro. Yeah, again, that you can use. Now, both of those, well, let's see. Actually, all of these you should be wearing a pair of gloves with, uh, especially, uh, well, now all of them. The acids, the Formic Pro, the, and the anything that uses oxalic, it is an acid and it will burn you. Uh, the others are, it's, can, are a contact ingredient and you get it on your skin, you can wash it off, but it's best to wear a pair of gloves while you're handling any, any of these products. I mean, you should be using gloves whenever you're mixing anything in your sprayer as a pesticide or a herbicide to use in your garden. Mm -hmm. um, also with garden sprayers, it's a good thing to wear a mask so that the filters filter out any particulate matter that's in the air from the sprayer, especially if it's really fine droplets and uh, that's kind of it for that. Uh, now is the time to treat. Uh, probably your best bet is to do a knockdown treatment. Now with it still as warm as it's getting, probably the Apovar or the uh, Hopguard would be the better choice because there's no temperature temperature requirements on them other than a low temperature for hot guard. Um, the Formic Pro, the Apigard, and the OA, as long as the temperatures are low enough, you know, they're good. Apigard has a lot higher range, that's up at 100 degrees. Uh, the main way you can tell that it's getting too warm when you're trying to use some of these products is they are a fumigant and if it's too warm it'll drive the bees right out of the hive. Uh, with the Formic Pro if the temperature is high uh, you can also have some queen issues if the temperature is too high for the treatment. But now's the time uh, to get your initial treatment on. You probably ought to think about using another treatment, not the same one, choose a different one uh, in October. Uh, I would, for that, I would not recommend using Apovar. If you're gonna use Apovar at the end of the 42 days or thereabouts, you need to get the strips out. You do not wanna leave the strips in over winter uh, because the amount of treatment that is coming out of the strip does not kill the mites it just makes them a little bit sick. And then if you go to use Apovar next year, they go up and lick the strip and get bigger. No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> super mites. <laughs> they become super mites because that's, that's what happened with all of our previous, previous ones. Now, if it's any consolation, there is another treatment. It looks like it's beginning to be viable again. It looks like uh, Apistan is on the way back in. Uh, the active ingredient in that was fluvalinate, uh, and that's not on this list, but okay. the uh, research is beginning to show that it's getting a 94 to 96% kill rate on mites. Uh, basically, apostan, due to misuse, became the mites became resistant to it, and it only lasted a couple of years because people thought if I put the strip in and leave the strip in, it's good. Well, no, not so much. Huh. Uh, but how was that applied? The how thing to remember applying? with all these treatments is you're trying to kill a bug on a bug. Yeah. The April uh, stain, how was that applied? Uh, that's a strip. So it's kind of like, like an April bar type thing? Yes, it was a quasi clear brownish colored strip. It, you could see through it. Uh, the ape of our strips are white and you can't see through those. Uh, Lynn, if you scroll down some. Sure. 
there's some notations here and some discussions about how to uh, make up the dribble solution and uh, how to be able to use uh, Easy Check, which is a mic checking product that's out there. That if you're going to do checks, that's a good one. Uh, it doesn't hurt. You don't have to check all your highs, but check some of your highs at least before you treat them and then check them after you've treated them to make sure that your treatment worked. Um, a couple of years ago, they had a problem with a batch of Apovar that was made that basically it didn't kill mites. And a lot of people treated with Apovar and found out that it really didn't kill the mites very well and they didn't go back and check afterwards. So that was an issue. But this is up on the up on the Facebook page, and I think it went out in an email too. Yep. Uh, so it's just a gives you background information on all of the effective current treatments, and gives you some additional information about vaporization and yep. how to do check mic or check for mic count. Good info. It's also always in our files section on the Facebook page. So you just have to go to the top where it says files, and this is there, and as well as other things. So. Thank you, Lloyd. That was very, very good chart here. I, I like having that. Okay. Any questions for Lloyd? Look, I thought the um, EPA said that you could do um, oxalic vapor with Superzol now, starting this year. Is that? That was rescinded. Was it? Yeah. Okay. Wow. That's what I, I understand. Always, I didn't think it was a good idea, and I never did it. And I, I was asking other people if they did it. Someone said, oh, yeah, I did it. And I thought, yeah, no, I'm, I'm going to hold off. Well, there's oxalic acid contained within the honey the same way there's formic acid within the honey. Uh, and like formic, the formic pro stuff or, or uh, right away quick strips, which is an older product that's still available. Uh, that the elevate, it elevates the level of the formic acid and it also elevates the level of oxalic acid in the honey, but over a short period of time, the level goes back down. Now, I don't know what the issue was with the oxalic, but they did, um, I looked before I made that chart up that they, now it's that you can't use, use it with honey supers on it, or that it's, at least that's, that's what the chart said. And you, do you carry these items at your store? Uh, pretty much have everything but the Ava Life Bar. I haven't been able to get any of that, and I really have never really had much of anybody request it because yeah. it's it's kind of a pain to use. Because, <laughs> <laughs> like I say, it's like a, a graham cracker, and you have to break it up in parts and set it in the corners of the of the hive on uh, on the top of the hive underneath the inner cover. And then you have to go back and put another set of treatments in, and uh, it's okay. It supposedly is an effective treatment. Uh, there are several treatments I left off of this because they're they're painful to use. Like Supercide works, which is basically you're spraying, you're treating the bees with sugar water. Uh, you have to spray it into the colony. It's kind of like uh, doing the dribble method, but it's just a sugar syrup. That's all it, it is? Controls mites. Yeah, but it's 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 a pain in the butt to use because it's kind of like doing the oxalic treatment with vaporization. You have to go through and do the treatment every three or four days uh -oh. for at least like six to eight treatments for it to be effective. Uh oh. So the idea is it coats the bees with sugar water and they clean each other and pull the mites off? I guess that's the way it works. Or they drown? I've never used it. I've read about it. 
and I never, like I say, I've never bothered to carry it because okay. it's it's painful to use. Sounds like a plan. Thank you. I will say too, I do have a full mask when I do mine, the the filters and the face shield, so it is, yeah. it's not worth. If you've ever heard Randy Oliver speak, you can tell he does without a mask. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want that. Uh, yeah, if you don't have a full mask, you should at least wear glasses or, or goggles because of, uh, especially for the, the dribble method, because you can have splashing and spillage from that. Uh, pretty much with the vaporization, if you stay out, out of the, the cloud of of the vapor, you're okay, but still the wind can change at any time. Uh, and like I say, it would be good to wear goggles or have the full mask. The full masks are quite a bit more expensive. Okay, gotcha. Well, the main, you know, I, it, the main thing is, is when they say mask, this is not like a little white paper mask right. that doesn't cut it. You have to have a respirator. This is a full, full, full blown wet, either a full face or a half face. And with the proper um, filters, um, cartridges, filter, cartridges. Filters, cartridges, filters on the side. And I find with mine, um, when I originally bought mine was through a lab safety book, but now uh, like the cartridges, I can buy them off of Amazon now. And I know what the numbers are and I find Every well, you, season, pretty much every season, I put a whole, I put a brand new set of cartridges on. You can get the mask and at Home Depot and the appropriate cartridge for about twenty five bucks, and the cartridges are like ten or twelve dollars, and Home Depot has the cartridges. Uh, I don't remember if it's an AP one hundred or a P one hundred. It's one or the other. I don't know. I mean, I my it, my mask is a P one hundred. My mask is on an older mask. The newer ones are kind of like elongated cartridges. Mine are round. It's, I've had it for a long time, so. Yeah, they all work the same. Yeah, Lloyd, I got a, a clarification, hopefully, that you can give me. So um, I've been, I'm currently in an OAV cycle, and based on um, the drone pupate uh, cycle, there are 14.5 days in the pupa, so I've been... I have it calendared so that I'm doing one OAV treatment every five days for 15 days in order to make sure I zap all the mites. Does that jive with what you're saying? Uh, even though the mite, the cell isn't capped, if the mite is down underneath the pupa, okay, it's not going to be exposed. So typically what the treatment regimen would be would be uh every four days for seven seven treatments for seven treatments okay well, that would give you the 28 days that actually takes you because you're 21 or 21 for brood and that carries you over and gives you a, a little bit extra cycle time especially with um drone with what with the drone brood, it goes, oh. what is it, 24 days? Yeah. Okay. And then, and then when did this uh, rescinding happen with OAV and Honey Supers? I was totally uh, in In the past, like, three or four months. Oh, so it's recent. It's recent. So because we the original, they originally gave it approval to be used with Supers on, and then about four or five months after that, Six months after that, they rescinded it. Okay, so if I currently, if I treat it with OAV with supers on, do I now have to flag those frames? Theoretically not, because as I said, mentioned before, with either the oxalic or the formic acid, if the super set for a while, it, the level of the acid and drop, drops down. Due to exposure, to not being exposed to additional treatment. And then, uh, last question about OAB. Um, 
it's it's been my experience, and I wear the organic acids uh, respirator filters. Um, it's been my experience that the the vapor dissipates pretty quickly. But I do have hives on rooftops that have AC intake, like ducts on these roofs. Is this something I should be worried about? Because or because it dissipates so quickly, it's not really concerned. It really isn't that it's dissipated. It's pretty much that it's fallen to the ground. Okay. Because it's it's not really. It's a vapor, but it's not a vapor. <laughs> right. Right. But it it you know when it's in the cloud stage, that's the the state where it's beginning to go back to a crystalline stage only in a much finer crystal than it is when you're loading it into the vaporizer. It. And if you close the hive, if you inject the vapor into the hive and once you pull the vaporizer out, you close it up or you close it up and make a, an entrance reducer that's a solid strip with just a quarter inch hole or if you're using a pan vaporizer put the pan in and put a some foam in or something, a wet towel to close the entrance of the hive up. And pretty much most all the vapor goes through, goes or stays within the colony. Okay, and I lied. I have a couple more questions. <laughs> okay. Take all that. <laughs> Sorry. So, um, I have I have an Oxivap, so it, it has that little crucible that you uh, you dump the you invert it and then read and then and then write write it up. So um, I've done both. Uh, I, I stick the little nozzle in. I've done both treatments. I do it above and I've also stuck it through a hole that I've drilled through the the bottom board. Um, does have you seen or do you know of any difference in the application whether you apply it above or below? Uh, typically everybody applies below. I don't know a bunch of anybody that applies above. Uh, the vapor rises. The vapor rises. I use it. It's hot I have a... and it comes out and it rises. And have... it's best to use to drill the hole in the back of the bottom board because yeah. then rather than in the back of the hive body or of the box that the, the bees are in, because you can be shooting it into the end bar of a frame. Right. Other than in between the frames. So that that provides a limitation. When you're putting it in on the bottom board, it's got an area to expand out into to fill the whole hive and rise up. And if, if you're doing that, you want to close to me you would want to close the entrance, otherwise it's going to shoot out the entrance. Oh, absolutely. I always close the entrance in any upper openings that I have. Um, I, and I've noticed that it does rise except in December when it's freezing out and then it sinks. You watched it or something or what? Uh, yeah, yeah. I will say I get less going out the top in December in the colder months too, but I feel like it still fills the, the cavity of the hive. Okay. Well, in December the bees, <laughs> if you have enough stores on, the bees are still going to be in the bottom box. Okay. And then lastly, about the the respirators, um, if you have a, uh, if you're lazy with your shaving like I am, uh, those masks don't exactly fit well. So be aware of that. If you have yeah. screen, by, by the way, for if you are using formic, I'm sorry, if you're using oxalic, you really don't need an organic vapor mask. Uh, usually, what is they have for it is a, uh, it's either an AP100 or a P100. It's actually a particulate mask, is the one that's recommended for it. Oh, so I'm, so what but I'm the doing... Vapor mask, the vapor mask should work because it's going to basically do the same thing. But if I recollect correctly, I think the organic acid masks are a lot more expensive. They are. I was just being overly cautious. Okay. If, if you have a screen bottom board, should you 
close that off? You have to close, you have to okay. close the screen off. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. IPM boards for sure. Okay. I'm searching. I have a picture of the damn mask here somewhere. Of course, I can't find it, but anyway. I'll... If, you, if you go with the 3M masks or the ones that are colored pink. Yes, that's what I have. Right? Yes. But that's the, over, that's the overkill filter that, that Lloyd <laughs> said. <laughs> I was being overly diligent about it. Okay. That's, that's... Like I said, the, the masks are available at Home Depot. You have to remember it if you're getting the, I'm sorry, the respirator, we'll call it the right thing. If you're getting your respirator at Home Depot or Lowe's, they have the respirators in two different places. They have them in the paint department, and that's not the one you want. You want the ones that are in the other department, okay? And they're usually about two aisles apart in the paint department. There's very, just base, some real basic masks with just genuine basic cartridges and the other aisle uh, they usually show two places for them uh, when if you do uh, looking at their app for the store they'll give you two different locations for respirator masks and you want the other aisle which gives you a bigger selection and also better masks than just the paint mask okay. safety aisle it's got all the goggles and gloves and stuff yeah safety aisle okay and I'm, I'm sorry, we jumped on the call late. Did you make a mention or uh, of HopGuard 3 versus the previous editions of HopGuard? Uh, it's basically, they did change the formulation and they changed the strip some. Uh, the old strip used to be a smooth pasteboard strip. They had a piece of plastic inside of it uh, to give it more strength so it didn't fall apart. The new strip is more of a corrugated material and it holds more of the active ingredient on the strip when you're putting it into the colony. And that's the like difference. There was a slight formulation change, but it's mostly a change in the delivery method. Have you used it? Do you like it? I've used it when it was the old strip. I've used the new strip. It works. So messy. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say I I didn't like it. It was I had to wear gloves, and it was just so you know the the it gooey as hell. Yeah, yeah, the goo was <laughs> everywhere, and I thought I'm not using these anymore because you got to store them in a sealed container, and you never use them all. And I'm just like, I was like, oh, I'm not. yeah, that that was my experience with the previous editions. But if the new stuff is good, then maybe I, I'll I'll use it. Or have you used it? Is it effective? I've heard that it isn't effective. Do you know about it? I have, I've, I've heard mixed results. I, I basically stick with Formic, OA, and uh, Apigard, Thymol. And, and when are you applying your Apigard? When? When? Temperature. Right now. Uh, right now. Right now. <laughs> and have you had any problems with queens or absconding or anything like that and how much how much you putting in i'm using the ready-made trays i'm not using the bulk stuff which i probably should because i have enough hives that it's probably more economical um so far so good i'm i'm in the middle of the cycle so i don't know what the effect of this is so far i think you're well, good with the temperature you, one thing huh? you can do robert is if you're using the trays don't throw the trays away ah okay because when you get it in the bulk method, it comes, they give you a piece of aluminized, like light duty cardboard that you squirt it onto from a syringe. Right. Where if you got the tray, you've got some sides on it that keeps it from running around. Got it. Well, I wish you would have told me that three weeks ago. <laughs> Well, if you need any more, I've got bulk containers <laughs> and, and trays. Okay. Very good. Any other questions? <laughs> I guess I'll add one more thing in here. Uh, I've gotten calls over the last couple days for people wanting extractors. So we're in the process of trying to uh, find out what's going on with extractors and uh we are off 
we are offering a discount on them. So if anybody wants, wants in on extractors, take a look in the Man Lake catalog, and if something suits your fancy, give us a call. Chris Hart. <laughs> he already called. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> of course he did. <laughs> okay, good. And then I just I just had one question for Lynn. When's the when's the gathering when I can get my t shirt? Oh, okay. Well, that is to be determined. Um, the I will get notification that they're ready for pickup on the twenty eighth of August and I can pick them up and I can, you know, possibly meet you or just hang on to them till we have another uh, meetup, which probably I don't know if anybody wants to do it like Saturday of Labor Day weekend or not. I, I'm sure people have plans and that's not good. Right, exactly. Um, the following weekend, the following two weekends, I'll be away, but that doesn't mean I can't hand it off to Brian or Lloyd or Chris or whoever, you know, to hand the stuff out if, if you have a meetup while I'm gone. So um, I'm going to when I get the stuff, I'm going to, you know, send something out. And if anybody wants to meet me to pick it up, we can do that. You can also pick it up at the store um, or just I'll just hang on to it till we have our meetup and when we decide when that's going to be. It'll be in September, but I, I just don't know exactly when at this point. So, but thank you for. Well, Lynn, are you away just on the weekends? No, no. No, I, I go away the 9th to the 16th, I think it is. And, yeah, Labor Day weekend, I'm busy. So it's the following weekend from the 9th to the 16th. I'm, I'm happy. Day, if you were going to be around, if you were going to be around on a, during a weekday, we could do something on a weekday night. Well, I mean, that's up That's up to everybody. Yeah, we could do that. That's not a problem. We could do it a Friday night if you wanted. You know, I, I don't know what everybody's work schedules are or, you know, that kind of thing. So, um, and we could, we could do it maybe this, the 17th on a Sunday um, after I get back too. So, to be determined. But thank you for, for uh, wanting to wear our colors, <laughs> our logo. I appreciate that. Uh, and again, I, I tuned in late, but if, in case anybody else missed the, the announcement, congrats to Brian and Carly Faye. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. There, there will be, there will be a... A, a wedding celebration meetup out in uh, is that Frederick? It's Mount Airy. Mount Airy. It's a, no, it's like halfway between Westminster and Frederick. Okay. Uh, oh. We could have a phrase brewing. So, October seventh. October seventh. October seventh. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully, we'll have something before then. But oh, you're definitely yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Great. All right. Charlie, what do you got to say for yourself? Well, um, as far as mite treatments go, I I have a tub of Apigard, but I was real concerned because it was 90 plus degrees, high humidity, and I don't have the uh, experience with it to just see whether or not. Um, so I went ahead and got some uh, Apivar and I uh, drop, which I basically I'm doing the same thing I did last year. I drop Apivor strips in, and that was on the 28th, I think it was, of July. They'll be coming out around the 2nd of September, which is six weeks. And then I'll come behind that as, as soon as the weather is, I like it to be at 80 degrees or slightly less in low humidity, and I'll put Formic Pro in for two weeks and double strip it. You know, with a, well, actually, the satchel comes with two strips for the ten framers, and um, put some on, put a strip on a nuke. I know it's not on the label, but it works. Um, 
and then I'll come back and then in October I'll start doing oxalic acid vapor once or twice a month as long as it's 48 degrees and the cluster will be loose in the hive and um, I'll do that all the way through fe February of the next year if everything goes well as far as the weather goes. October still is fairly warm and everything. Um, that's what I'll do for my mite treatments. That's what I did last year. Uh, Sybil came by and uh, asked me to participate in the National Honey Bee Survey. So my results was I had a 0 0.2 mite infestation, which was below 1%. So that was nice to know. And um, it seems that that'll, um, my mite treatment program works, I'll put it to you that way. And um, honey supers are off, and my I run all mediums on my production hives, and uh, my winter configuration is three mediums. Uh, I went out last week and looked at five of my production hives, and um, all the top supers um, were full of uh, honey, and I presume lanternfly whatever's out there. There's some clover around. Uh, there's not a lot of nectar that comes off of that, but so that was good. I don't, that'll cut my, like last year, I cut my sugar bill by 500 pounds and um, I'll be able to, then I start feeding them usually right around the week after Labor Day, week or two weeks at the latest. And I'll do sugar water two to one or close to two to one. And, um, and my nukes are, I mean, for the folks, that I can run at least a dozen honey hives. I run 20 nukes. I sell the nukes in the spring. Try to keep a five over five, 10 frames total in my nukes. And um, they're doing well. Everybody, And then in those production hives that I did check, I found several frames up in the top with uh, solid sheets of brood and stuff like that. I did find one queen up there hanging out so um, everything looks good as far as my uh, the amount of bees and um, you know a good solid amount of them something I do is I do a single brood chamber management meaning I take come last week of March I drop it down to two mediums queen excluder honey supers and then I put a brood super on top and cycle cat frames of brood from the bottom to the top and give them empties to keep the queen from swarming and increases honey production. Uh, I got 975 pounds of honey this year. If I did have about four queen issues in my production area, so I think I would, if, if it wasn't, because you know, as soon as that happened, now your brood, your bee population starts to diminish, and I'm dropping in nukes with queens to revitalize that. And I think if I didn't have to do that, I'd probably been right around 1,200 pounds this year. So I got enough to get me from one season to the next for sales. And um, queens are pretty good. I've got four, well, I guess five queens that I've been, I raised up and there, some of them are in the second five frame box expanding, some of them are not. And I've been kind of trying to feed and push them along, get them ready for winter and, um, and that kind of thing. I was going to use April Guard. I just felt it was just too hot in August and July at the time. And, um, uh, I don't know. I just don't want to risk my queens at this time of the year. And um, I was talking to, um, I belong to the Westchester Bee Club up in Chester County, PA. And I've seen them in the past years. You know, they're dropping Formic Pro or Might Away or Apricard. And, you know, it's okay for them to say, oh, well, I lost a percentage of their queens, you know, because they listen to the folks selling it, I guess, were to say, well, your queen was, there's all these excuses that was a queen's problem, it wasn't the product problem. And I'm like, 
I can't afford that. You know, I want to be more cautious, especially when it's hot and humid. And um, I find that even on the directions, it doesn't say anything about humidity, but I find in form any of the acids, humidity plays a huge part, I think, in whether it's detrimental to your bee, bees and queens and stuff like that. So that's what I'm up to is right now. Um, like I said, I'm checking honey supers are good. Like Brian said, I just open them up, pull a couple frames out, put them back in. I'm, you know, you can pretty much tell when you look. I had four or five of them in there that, you know, you had good big population, a lot of sort of wax up on top of the frames. And you can just tell by looking at it that they were full of honey or and, and brood up in the area. And then there was one there that was good population for the most part, but you didn't see any of the wax up on top of the frames. And you pull them up, and some of those frames are actually empty with no nectar in them at all. So every hive is different. You got to, and you know, even with the full honey supers, I will still put top high feeders on and feed until they stop. And all so uh, been doing that um, for the ones that don't know I have my uh, YouTube channel been I that'll be another video about me going into the hive and checking and I and also checking my Queens and stuff like that and um, I've been I just finished up uh, cleaning all my queen excluders using my solar wax melter so all i had to do every morning is go out there put a new one in and walk away and as long as it's a beautiful sprite sunny hot day come back at 4 30 in the evening and it's completely done and i think there's probably a couple pounds of wax out there i i i've been trying that charlie and i hate to say this but the angle of the sun now i mean and it like all of a sudden this the angle is getting you know, starting to lower. Yeah. It's not melting the wax as fast as it was. I was really well, shocked. Here lately, it's been cloudy. And yeah. In the morning, is overcast. Like yesterday, it was kind of overcast. Well, you're not going to get a whole lot of uh, work out of that. You yeah. know, there was the one day I first put it on there. It was one of those super bright, hot, sunny days. And about an, within 45 minutes, that one queen excluder I put in there was completely melted. I was just totally surprised. And even the propolis was there's some brown goo on some of the steel uh, rods but even that was all gone and everything but you know you compare to where you got a, a soup or a squid excluder and you got all these rows of wax and then you take your hive tool and then you scrape 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 well then your shoulder gets to hurting <laughs> and then you know and then you take and you sit, sit it up i had it kind of against me and the building and i got a a um, paint um, heater, you know, uh, melter, you know, whatever you call it, a heat gun, and I'm sitting there doing it all but half. Well, now all I do is throw it in the box and walk away, and it's done. And I didn't have to do any scrape. Well, I did a little bit of scraping around. Some of most of mine are wooden bound. Uh, and if it doesn't things. happen today, it'll happen tomorrow. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know. Did you make that, Charlie, or did you buy it? No, the quickest the uh, honey, um, the uh, wax motor was made by a guy in one of, in the club in the Susquehanna Beekeepers. He had used my my lumber, and uh, it's just just big enough for that queen excluder. I mean, I if I was knowing it now, I would make the you know drip tray long enough and wide enough for a queen excluder to drip down into. I really like how pretty the wax is that comes out of that. I mean, it well, is. But, and the bit, and I didn't, and I had people tell me this and never paid attention. And all it is is get yourself a, the cheapest paper towel you ever could find. Yeah. Take one sheet off, and I the way mine is the tray slanted. It comes to a V, and it's an open slot about an inch tall. And then originally, or still has it, it's a half inch um, hardware cloth built, built uh, bent on an angle. And that was more or less the, uh, that catched all the slum gum out of your wax. Well, put that in there, put that one piece of 
of uh, paper towel that's out of your kitchen. You don't want to double it or nothing, just one layer, one, one sheet, and lay it in there and kind of put the wax on it to where it's, you know, it doesn't lay over or anything like that. And it will filter all the, that wax will be bright and yellow. It's gorgeous. And, and all that brown goo and sludge will stay right there. And then if you get out there where she's still good and hot, and you might want to wear some gloves because it's that hot, you know. You can pick that um, uh, hardware cloth with that paper towel on there. I picked it up with all that sludge laying on there. And then just walk it over to, you know, wherever you want to throw it. And just dump the whole thing out onto the ground. And then put your wire back. And then I used to take my hive tool and scrape the pan that's, you know, around on both sides. There's sludge, you know, that thick and scrape it and throw it out in the yard and then reset the whole thing with another new paper towel. Uh -huh. But the paper towel works a great, it's a great filter. The only thing I've had in that solid piece of wax was there was bees that got in there and it, what it does, it comes out of the pan and that water falls over into a little tub and I keep about uh, half an inch to an inch worth of water in the bottom of that so the wax will cool and float on that. And sometimes the bees will get in there and they'll get in under the wax. And of course, now you got a bee body in your <laughs> wax. But you're gonna you're gonna re you know I have one of them pots from Man Lake that's got a you know it's a, an electric pot skillet type thing and it's got a faucet on the end of it. And I put that wax in there in the winter time and get yourself a, a strainer, that kitchen strainer with a steel mesh, you know. And you can either put um, another piece of paper towel or um, coffee, a coffee filter, or some uh, cheesecloth. Cheesecloth is expensive, I found out. So you've got coffee filters or whatever, you use some of that. And now that'll filter out all the real fine, fine particulates. And uh, Kim Flottam actually claims that slum gum is great compost. Ah. Huh. And he grows great tomatoes from it. Ah. Oh. Okay. <laughs> okay. That's cool. That's cool. But uh, that worked out real well for me. And it, like you say, when you got a dozen or more screens, you got to clean off. You know, you can just throw one out there, one every day when it's super hot. You know, sometimes I go out there at noontime and it's clean as a whistle, and then I'll put another one in there, and I'll either check it at 4:30 or I'll come back the next day and see it. Depends on how bright and clear the day is and all that and um so that's that's what i've been up to um it's just so are, uh, you gonna, are you gonna wrap your hives again this this year you um, the, the, the ones that are right behind me are past they're the, the um the one there that's got the yellow purple yellow that's closest to the barn and those those stick out past the barn and the wind blows towards me from the log pile and everything. And uh, I will put carpet around there, yes, as a wind block. It's not insulation. And when, then, when are you gonna do that? Oh, uh, probably November. Okay. You know, when it gets cold and it stays cold. Right now you're in them. You, you don't wanna be fooling with carpet. It's a, it's a nuisance having to get in there in the winter time if you have to. Yeah. Especially when like when I'm- You wanna make sure you get enough of it before you gotta use it, you know? What's that? You mean the carpet or? Yeah, make sure you get it. You know, if you're, if you're, yeah, well, go to your local carpet, carpet installer and say, hey, you got any dirty carpet you want to get rid of? It's five feet wide, Ew. and it can be it can be in rolls of ten foot or whatever, something you can handle, and then just take your knife, your exact, your uh, razor blade knife, and cut it, and tip, you know, from the have it to where it's sitting on the ground, and it comes up and around the sides. And then you kind of lap the top over, and then I ratchet strap it all down, and I'm, you know, it's like a little igloo. So The other part of it is it can be carpet that they ripped out to put new carpet in. Yeah. Well, that's what I get. I get yeah. I get all the ripped out carpet. I, it's free. It's free. They're wanting, to get, they're wanting to get rid of it because they're, they're going to pay them to get it to put in a dumpster. But if they can get like a, like a 
piece of carpet like out of a hallway, you know, so, well, I'm talking about more of an industrial hallway. So, but yeah, you want a piece of carpet about five, six feet wide. And that, you know, depending on the height of your eyes and wrap it around and it works fine. Now my nukes sit behind my barn and the barn axe is a, is a wind block. So I don't wrap any of those. Do you put the fuzzy side in or the fuzzy side out? I put the fuzzy side in. in. Okay. You want the carpet, if you, if you look at carpet, it has that mesh in the back. Right. And a lot of the good carpet, it's got like a glue that's all over it. Well, that glue acts kind of like a, a, a water shed. It'll shed the water off. It doesn't, the carpet won't get soakingly wet, you know. And the only downside is through the winter time, I got to sort of pick that back that carpet up so I can hit my ProVap in there and hit them with oxalic acid vapor. Now, when I do vaporize, what I do is, is I have poroplast or the corrugated plastic signboard, your, you know, get your crop of political uh, election year signboard <laughs> out to and uh, get them to where they fit, you know, unless you already have one that came with the hive or something. Stick it in there, and I, I close mine up in the wintertime when it gets below, uh, say, 45 steadily throughout the day and whatever. I close it up. When I'm vaporizing, I have little wooden wedges that are about five inches long or so, four to five inches long that I made. And on the 10 framers, I put them in each corner, two in the back and two in the front. That holds that core class up tight. I'm trying to seal this thing up. And I got enough, I mean, they're not, I'm not, I got wedges for all the highs. So, I mean, I'm wedging and got all that lined up. And then, I take uh, the uh, blue styrofoam insulation, find yourself a piece of that, and I cut it to where it's, usually it's an inch and a half thick, so I do an inch and a half square, maybe two inches by inch and a half. And um, I make it to where it's just a little bit wider than the bottom board edges, and I, I push that in there, and it kind of like seats itself in there so because the bees will push it out they have enough strength they'll push it out if it's loose and i put that in the front and i put the four wedges in the bottom and then i vaporize the hive and it's pretty much sealed up solid do you do you guys any of you use um quilt boxes no no i use I don't. I don't do it anymore. I used to, and I had less hives. Now, if anything, I'll do. Uh, uh, well, before I was using the mountain camp method for sugar, but now I don't even do that. I just do sugar frames, where if I need to emergency free, I'll just pour dry sugar into a drum comb and spritz it with water, and then put it in the hive, and the bees will chew through it. So I don't have to worry about any weird feeding thing or adding shims or anything. Okay. Yeah, in spring, but still there, I'll just wash it out or leave it out. Rain wash it, it. Okay. But Lynn, it's best if you feed them enough in the fall that you don't have to fool with that crap. <laughs> yeah, well then, then I can't take my honey in the fall because if I leave my honey, then they're fine. But if I want my you honey, you should have all your honey extracted by now. This is Maybe. the second go round, Charlie. I get two flows, and somebody yeah. in this room said to me, "Sugar is cheaper than honey." wonder who said that, yeah. Mr. Lloyd. <laughs> yeah. It is, but I mean, I do have, a, you got a small, you know, side flow. You can pull that off. And... Well, the, the flow, the, the honey supers are coming off next week. I, they were going to come off tomorrow, but I have to pick up grandkids and I can't be bothered with that this weekend. So next week. So. Yeah. You can't be bothered with the grandkids or the honey. <laughs> <laughs> Um, <laughs> can I get back to you on that? <laughs> but, uh, now, as far as the top, I don't have a top. I don't use top end covers. And the only thing I do do, I do still use inner covers. And I have two wooden blocks that um, are five eighths thick, inch and a half wide, about two inches long. I make them up and, and keep a bunch of them. And I always put those in the two top front corners. That 
raises that tally cover up just a little bit, just enough for airflow. I don't have any moisture problems, and I keep that in there year round. What about? You, use, you can also use wooden queen cages if you have any. Yeah. Okay. That's about what the dimensions of those are. What about? You know, you see these YouTube videos with the the, the big guys that have the thousand hives. They don't do any of that. Yeah. But they, but they use that, I call it bubble wrap with tin foil, but the, the... Yeah, flex, flex wrap. Okay, I mean... The majority of them do not, the majority of them just use a migratory cover. Oh, okay. All right. Ian Steffler made that popular. Well, I just, I, I, I hate to say that, but I like when they lift it and it goes... Creak. I just like that sound. I'm weird. I know. Yeah. <laughs> well, the thing of it is, you make a mess with the propolis, and then you almost connect the frame with the propolis at the top, and then you got to get all rid of all that stuff. Yeah. To get down and inspect the frame. So I we tried those foamies for a little bit, but it was it was a pain in the ass. Yeah. If if you want to use anything, and you should have plenty of it, if you have horses yet, no. Take a feed bag and cut the feed bag up so that it's just bigger than the top of the hive, so you can take the. If you're using a migratory cover, you just take the migratory cover off and you can peel the feed bag up. Well, I have... Or the next, or the next time we're at a brewery, uh, or if you want them, I can get all the all of the grain bags you want. Yeah. It's a real fine... It's almost like uh, a seed bag. Yeah. It's real yeah. fine woven plastic. Yep, yeah. yep. Yeah. Now, I, I actually have enough quilt boxes that I've made in the past for my hives this year, so I'll continue to use those. But um, my my future plans are to have many more hives and I'm not making quilt boxes for all those damn hives. So I just... What well, do you you find it? I mean, do they get wet or what? Oh, uh oh. No, I, I, put, I put shavings, um, cedar shavings in top. Yeah, or, I know. I, I always looked at them and I'm like, why go through all that? It's another piece of wood or material or a piece of hive equipment that you think you need that you don't really need. <sighs> okay. But if you want them. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I said I have enough for my hives right now, but when I become the most experienced beekeeper in the entire world and I have hives everywhere, I'm not going to be using those. And if you think that's going to happen, don't hold your breath. <laughs> So Charlie Lloyd, you don't use insulated top covers during the winter? Nope. No. Just about everything I use is just a migratory cover on top. No winter cover. Just a migratory sits on the top of the box. Wow. I do inner cover and tele cover just like most people do. I mean, there's some people out there, they put in that blue foam and they, you know, about keeping the hives alive and the heat and all that stuff and I don't know. I, I, I've come to the conclusion when it comes to beekeeping, it's it's kind of like, it's definitely local. It can be, and local can be within five miles of the next guy, depending on what's blooming in that area versus, you know, this is like Lynn. Lynn's got a flow. Yeah. I don't have a flow. I'm done. <laughs> you know, come July, it's it's over with. Now, the only flow that's come in the last two years is the lanternfly, where it's filling up my super. Prior to that, I used to get a text from somebody say, "Hey, you know your bees? I'm getting complaints from the bee, uh, the swim club, you know that there's bees over there, you know." And I'm like, "Well, what? You know?" So she says, "Are you feeding?" And I'm like, "Yes, I'm feeding. <laughs> I just dropped a hundred, a hundred twenty gallons of sugar water, and they ought to be kind of hungry." And um, so, but now the last two years. I got honeydew from the spotter lanternfly. I, that's what I'm presuming, especially this year. Last year, for sure. And I've got supers that are full. My honey supers are full in the third box. And I'll top them off with sugar water. And and I'll, I'm pretty much done. I, I do an entrance reducer. My entrance reducer I made up to where it's like dental molding. I got five or six little slots that are three-eighths by three-eighths. That way the one bee can go in and out. If one gets plugged up with a dead bee, there's other slots for them to get out. And that kind of thing. And um, Well, one so. of the things is if you're using a telecover, you almost positively have to use an inner cover. 
Otherwise, you'll tear your boxes or the tele covers up trying to get them off. Yeah, well, that's what the foamy's for, if you, if you really yeah. think about it. It's an inner cover. It's just a different style. The problem, I talked to Brad last night from up in Canada, and he was using them up there, and he said the biggest problem with them is he get the wind gets to blowing, and then they're blowing everywhere, you know. He said they're, they're they, he calls them a they're nuisance, you know. He's what, going all Migratory covers? No, the darn bubble wrap. Oh, 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 okay. He's, you know, he's, you know, he's... And, and if you use that, you almost have to use a weight on top of the box to keep the telecover from blowing off. All right. All right. Well, like all of mine have bricks on. <laughs> oh, I have rocks on everything. Yeah. But, um, yeah, well, up there, they're putting them in barns. Yeah. So. Okay. Now, the, the other thing to kind of go along with this is we, we talk about having to wrap hives and all of that. The winters we're having now, uh, but according to the Farmer's Almanac, it's supposed to be a good big winter this winter, supposedly. Supposedly. But the winters we've had for the last several years, the weather hasn't been that bad for a reason to even wrap hives. Now, I agree with Charlie, if they're setting out in an exposed area where the wind's going to be blowing right on them, yeah, you need to get a windbreak up. You don't really need to get the black covers boxes to go down or to box and go through all of that. Uh, I know a bunch of guys that wrap their hives with tar paper, which to me is it's, it's not providing any insulation. It's not doing much of anything other than it's a pain in the butt to put on and take off and it's expensive. Right. Uh, and like I say, bottom boards, if I have a screen bottom board on, there isn't anything underneath the screen unless I'm doing a mic treatment. The bottoms are open year round. Oh, so you keep it on the moisture issues oh, okay. in the colony. Okay. And if you do that, you don't have to put blocks up in the top. They let air circulate through. You've got enough air circulation with the bottom board open. Now, and I say the bottom board is open, it's sitting on a hive stand where the majority of the bottom board, the screen bottom board is enclosed, isn't exposed to the open air. Uh, because it's a double H two by six hive stand okay. with the boxes sitting on them. So the air is reduced up of being able to get to the bottom board, but it's not enclosed at all. And that, I used to have a lot of problems with moisture where I had two or three yards when I went to screen bottom boards, all that issue went away, leaving them wide open all winter. And my, my bee losses weren't any worse than they, with them or without them, with being screen bottom boards. I forgot to put my thing in one year, and they they all made it. They didn't care, did they? They didn't care at all. I was like, oh my God, oh my poor bees. And they're like, hey, thank you. <laughs> like, okay. So, um, yeah, I, I think the biggest thing with lossage is is getting a mite plan, a mite treatment plan, and doing, you know, you you know, when I first started, it was all you did, you know, treat your mites in September, October, and you were done. And now it's treat your mites three times, you know, at least with three different products each year. And I used to do what Robert did with the oxalic acid vapor doing, I was doing two treatments a week, and I started in September. Uh, like this right after Labor Day and I ran it all the way to the end of October till the darn time change and I'm out there just hitting them and hitting them and hitting them you know and I'm figuring I'm going to get those mites as they're coming out and it didn't work I had a 60% loss in my nuke yard one year and I was like what the heck happened here you know so um I started the last couple of years, and it's a lot of work doing it that way. I mean, you're just constantly, you know, four hours a week hitting them and all. So now I do it where I'm doing a couple hours a month throughout the winter time, and I'm keeping the mite load low and um, and that kind of thing. And then I use the he used the chloroplast board, and I and what I usually do when I'm doing vapor, I will scrape that thing clean as possible, put that in, 
hit him with the vapor, come back before I hit him again the next time, and let's say three days later, and I'll pull those boards out and take a look. And, you know, I've had a, I, my nuke yard um, has four nukes per high stand. And um, I've had one right there in the middle. It was just loaded with. It looked like somebody poured a pepper box of whites on that thing. And the other ones were fine. They had three, four, five, or six on there, you know, as far as the drop. And then I took that one. It took me like three um I treated that one like three consecutive times to, you know, to hit them hard and, and drop that mite load down. And then it was fine after that. It They made it, but why they were worse than the rest of them and everybody else was treated the same, who knows? You know, but that's what I've learned as far as, I mean, you can have a queen issue. They can die on you with that. Um, but, um, you know, that's, you have a few, you know, I don't know, they, what is it, they say it's 40% in Maryland or something like that, the dead out, the dead rain, or, you know, the, I don't have that, you know, I might have 10% if I have that. Yeah, but it's the guys that don't treat that are making that up, or they only half treat. Uh, well, I don't like uh, filling out that. I, I had a guy last week call and ask me, do you think I should treat for mites? <laughs> I aren't. I used Easy Check, and I did an alcohol wash, and I had sixty-seven mites in the cat in the tray. Damn! <laughs> and I said, "Well, you can try treating." Might be too late. <laughs> it is too late. Now, that many mites. It's it's nigh on to too late. <clears throat> He can treat and kill a bunch of mites, but the chances of that hive making spring is slim and none in Slim Left Town. Jeez. Well, I was on uh, YouTube, or not YouTube, um, Facebook, and somebody, they were treating with, there was a question on there, a friend of theirs out, out of country was treating with that was a bar. That was Phil. Yep, that mm -hmm. was me. Yeah. That was you. Yes. And I'm like, Okay, I don't know. I answered the question I'm like, um, what country were they in? That's a tough one to answer. Because <laughs> okay. if you were in this country, and the, the way the question was framed, if you had an overload of mites, could you use a bolus of formic acid to shock them at the end of an apo apovar treatment? Whereas that's not how the directions for those two things read. So I wouldn't want anybody to give me any advice that was breaking any regulations in the state of Maryland. <laughs> well, well you, could, yeah. you could do that. That's perfectly legal. To use apovar and then follow it with a formic acid gas. That's yeah, what once, I'm once it cools down, which is what I'm waiting on right now, well, now the issue, you can do a formic acid vapor treatment, just do it in the evening. The temperature requirement is at the time of treatment because the treatment only lasts for three, four minutes. He's froze up. For no way. Are you well, there? talking about formic. Formic Pro is what you're talking about, right? Yeah. Um. So you got to remember one thing, and this is something I had to wrap my head around. Formic Pro, what does it treat? It treats the 80% of the mites that are underneath the cappings. Ox Apervar treats theoretic mites, the mites on the bees. And Formic um, Oxalic. Oxalic acid treats theoretic mites not underneath the cappings or the or the or the you know the mites on the on the on the bees and I had it in my mind that I could take my formic per, or my oxalic acid and kill the mites as they're coming out of the cappings and that just didn't work and I finally had to listen to the science folks and say okay let's use it in the winter time when it's the highest effective kill rate so that's why I use it throughout the whole winter 
and I actually met a young beekeeper guy several years ago down at um, Annapolis at the Maryland State Beekeepers um, Association meeting, and he was saying he was hitting these hives throughout the winter, and I said, okay, fine, I just, you know, never thought about it, but now I'm doing it at least once or twice a, a month, you know, depending on the weather conditions, and um, I think I'm maintaining, trying to maintain a very low mite load throughout the year, and I do not treat with any honey super silky, and I never can understand why some folks do. Is it is there mite load out of control by that time? Well, to your point, Charlie and Lloyd, regarding temp and treatment, have any of you seen queens that just continually lay throughout the winter? Uh, I've seen them in February, around the second or third week, and they'll have a a round patch of cat brood about that big, let's say two inches in diameter, and then there might be a small ring of eggs, but that might be a relatively mild winter to a certain extent, but they're ramping up at that time. That's when you're, if, if you have one of those, um, uh, what do you call them, heat monitors, uh, brood minders, yeah. you'll, you'll, I've seen people have them and they'll, They'll be going along and all of a sudden the darn temperature start rising up towards 90 some degrees in the hive and they're starting to raise brood at that time. Yep. They're doing they're doing it in February, definitely in March. Well, actually you know. a queen will start to lay eggs about the third week in January because that's about the time the days start getting longer. Noticeably longer. And the the spot of brood may only be as big as a quarter, but that's about when the queen starts to lay. And as she gets into the laying mode more, it opens the amount of brood increases. So consequently, you want to have your OA treatments done by then. OAB. You, again, it's, you've only got a spot of brood about the size of a quarter when she's starting out. It would be good to have OAV done before, but you can do OAV after that because there's still going to be mites there and you're going to still be killing mites. I'll, I'll do, you know, I'll do it all the way till the end of February, 1st of March. And then I'll, by that time, I'm, I'll, I'm done. Oh, I'm yeah. tired. I'm tired of it, <laughs> doing it, and I'm also done, you know, done till. You know, it's like bees right now. I, I, I'm to the point where, okay, I put my strips in three weeks ago. And last weekend when I did a video on going into the top of my hives, checking resources, that was the first time I was in them 10 frame honey production hives in the last three weeks. And, you know, they're, they're fine. You know, they got slabs of brood, you know, in, in certain places of it. Not all, not all up in the top, but a few of them. And um, you just you leave them alone. Um, and then there's other hives like my nukes. If I have a one five frame nuke there, and it's really building up, which I you know I know if it's a deep, I want another five frame on top of that deep. If it's a medium, because I run mediums for my backup insurance hives, I want at least three mediums, kind of equal to same amount of space as two deeps and i'll add i've been adding bo uh, boxes of drawing wax uh, frames to them so they can continue on and i've been feeding them been feeding them actually i don't feed them sugar water i feed them pro sweet because they can't smell pro sweet and i and like brian says i've got 10 framers i've got mediums and i've got two frame um, mating boxes, all in the same yard. And um, with ProSuite, they don't smell and they won't attack and rob those little baby hives. Okay, so, let me let me interrupt you right here. We can continue this, but I, I there's a couple of announcements. People are starting to leave. So I just wanted to um, say a couple things real quick. Um, okay. We were talking about the um, the merchandise from our shop. Um, again, um, I'll be getting a call the week of the 28th 
and I'll be picking up the items and you can, we can, you know, I'll make an announcement and you can contact me directly if you want, however you want to do it. Um, we'll come up with a date for a meetup and we can hand the stuff out then. Um, someone, I think it was Robert, um, mentioned about if anyone hears of any out yards or anybody who would like bees on their properties or whatever, I'm trying to make a list of that. I'm going to try and make a list of that. If anybody hears of somebody who wants beehives but doesn't, you know, ha doesn't want to take care of them, but you know, they 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 know of someone who wants them, let me know. Send me a message, whatever, and we're going to make a list so that people can, you know, add to their apiaries if they want by having more out yards if you want. Um, thirdly, free advertisement. If you want, if you have honey to sell and you don't have an avenue to sell it consistently, um, you know, we're going to be at different festivals, different fairs, different, you know, activities, but also when we go to our meetups, I've had several of the breweries ask me, you know, for contact information for honey for different things. So I'm going to make a list of people who have honey to sell. It's all up to you. We don't take a cut of it. It's free advertisement. It's going to be a list and that list will go with us wherever we go. And if people want to know who sells honey here and you might look and say, oh, somebody, oh, I'm in Frederick here. Oh, I can call this guy or I'm in the city. I can call this guy. Um, I'm in Lutherville. I can call this person, you know, that type of thing. You're selling it. Generally, I think the average price is about $15 a pound, but it's up to you to decide what you, you know, what a price you want to put on your honey. Um, if you have candles or anything else, just put your name on that list. And that's on, it's pinned at the top of the Facebook page. Um, and I'll send it out as an email too, probably in the newsletter um, that, you know, just contact us and, you know, we'll put your name on the list. Um, also with, um, you know, the, the, the um, bazaars and things like that are coming up. Uh, Christmas bazaars and, you know, Oktoberfests and things like that. If you want to, you know, set up a booth type of thing, you know, I'm going to try and get, you know, a list of that. Now, I don't know how much I'm going to be able to put all this together, but if you hear of anything, please let me know. We're going to, you know, try and keep an avenue open for everybody and make it easy for people to, if they want to sell their honey without setting up a formal shop or doing whatever. You, you, you know, you can have your place to sell your stuff. So looking out for you guys, for us, for us all. So um, I think that was the only, those were the only things that I wanted to mention, but please feel free to message me, message any of, any of us, you know, we'll, we'll do, you know, whatever. If you have any suggestions of ideas, you hear of something, let us know. You know, we're looking out for each other. So you, you have a favorite brewery you want us to visit? Let us know. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Uh, you know, we're, we're trying to hit them all. I, I, uh, you know, I, in our shop, we had the cozies and, um, of course it's kind of done to death, but, um, everybody, you know, when they go to different places, the beach or out of the country or whatever, you know, they have a picture of the cozy, you know, with their, with their logo on it or whatever, but we have a really cool, I don't know if you all saw it, but a bottle opener and, you know, I'm thinking that bottle opener's got to go a lot of places. <laughs> so, and we will be having our shop again later in the fall um, to have like sweatshirts and hats and, you know, things like that for colder weather. <coughs> so, that, but that's, um, I think that's all I have. So, if anyone has any questions, always just ask. We're open to everything. And if everybody wants to keep talking about mite treatment and whatever, I do have one quick question. If I have a struggling hive and it's only one, it's one deep right now, but I mean, it's struggling. Would I be better off putting it in a 
five frame nuke and overwintering it that way. Why is it struggling? Oh, Charlie, because I'm a lousy beekeeper. What did I tell you? No, I mean, did we have a queen issue? We had a queen issue. We had a queen issue. They finally have a queen, but she's not as great as I want her to be, but I don't think we have drones flying around. There's no point in pinching her and trying to make another queen at this point. No. I'm just figuring if I can try and keep it alive through the winter, great. But if it dies, it dies. There's nothing I can do about it. So have they got plenty of food in the box? They they, they do now. Food? They're they're getting they're getting sugar water with um, um, Apis Biologic. Um, but I also have recently obtained, um, rocket fuel, you know, <laughs> I basically <laughs> obtained some pro sweet and, uh, I want to finish up my sugar syrup first before I start with the pro sweet. So, um, I've been told that both of these items will hopefully promote a lot of growth. So we'll Maybe see. Well. Yeah. So we'll see. We'll see. Keep my fingers crossed. So. As, as an addendum to that, uh, we also have ProSuite available. Yes, yes. And, and I'm new to this, but I've been told that if we bring a bucket up to you, we can have you fill it so we don't have to keep buying a new bucket. Is that true or right. something to that yes. effect? Okay. Okay, cool. Cool. So. Yeah, I mean, the ProSuite I found, like I say, it, it alleviates a robbing frenzy and you know you can have a weak hive you can fill it feed them that and it won't let the other the other ones can't smell it and they won't rob them out for, for anybody that hasn't used it pro sweet is a feed honey weighs 11.55 pounds per gallon pro sweet weighs 11.55 pounds per gallon so it is almost the same density as honey. Uh, it's, if it's, it's cold weather, it's tough to get it out of the tote. <laughs> uh, you can dilute it to feed it if you so desire, but everybody I've talked to, it doesn't make much difference whether you dilute it or not. It's on there. They're taking it for feed and they'll grow groove with it just as well with that as they will if you thin it down or you use one-to-one -one sugar syrup. Uh, one thing I will tell you, unless you are absolutely crazy, do not, and I'll say it again, do not add lemongrass oil to the syrup that you feed bees. If you have never seen the robbing frenzy that you will have if you put in lemongrass oil. And that's in Honey Bee Healthy, too. Oh, really? It's in all the supplements. Yeah. But not in ProSweet. But not yeah. in ProSweet. Okay. ProSweet is just the feeds. And you can add you can add Apis Biologic to it. You can add tea tree to it. You can eat, add whatever you want to it. But it's just a sucrose product. Okay. Oh, I can put Apis Biologic in the ProSweet, too? Sure. Oh. Mm -hmm. Okay. I've been diluting my pro sweet one to one so far and they love it just because and I'm going to give it to them diluted just because I'm cheap. But <laughs> well, the, the you're whole honest. thing of it is, is if you're trying to get weight on the colony, you're better off to feed it straight. Okay. Because you'll put weight on the colony a lot faster and the bees have to do less work because there's a lot le less moisture in it. They don't have to harden the syrup harden that off in the cone. Okay. Well, that five gallon bucket's heavy and I'm trying to figure out, I guess I'm going to scoop it out and put it into a jar. Yeah. Well, or get yourself a, a bottling bucket, make up yourself a bottling bucket. Oh yeah. I could do that. With a, I got a, I put my, I, I've got a tote and I fill my bottling bucket up with pro sweet. Okay. And now I've got a gate on the bottom. And I can fill, let's say, a quart jar up or something like that. Okay. That makes more sense. Much more sense. Okay. All right. Awesome. Okay. So. I think you all have answered my questions. Anybody else have any questions? Phil, how much, how, how did you do, honey wise? 
I got about 30 pounds out of one hive. Wow. Good. I'm pretty happy with. Good. Good. And um, I got an, installed a nuke um, yeah, about two and a half weeks ago. Two weeks. Uh, well, in the first week, it, it filled up the 10 frames. Wow. Two weeks later, it filled up the medium I had put on top of it. Now, I, yesterday, I put another medium on top. And um, now you're covered up my tape. They're kind of light on the top box yet. And I am feeding them uh, sugar water. And I've got a honey flow going on of some sort because I can see bees from both hives and they're working. I don't know what it is, but we got a lot of sort of um, trees and shrubs with uh, white roundish kind of multi flower things. Yeah, yeah. fiber in them. They're uh, cream colored, yeah. purple, and red. They vi- the bees seem to like it. They're viburnum, yeah, and then there's the um, um, crepe myrtle, but they don't get much from it. I will post tomorrow some pictures of my um, not weed and my devil's walking stick um, because. And I'll show you how the bees are just all over it. You might have it around you, Charlie, and you don't know it. I mean, you know, it's it's just, it's a weed. It, Honest to God, before I kept bees, it would take over my, my horse fence line. And, I mean, it was just ruining the fence. And I just, I kept trying to cut it down, cut it down, cut it down, and using other things. And um, finally, I controlled it. But now that I have bees, I'm like... Go, baby, go, grow, grow. <laughs> so. and the only thing I've seen is, like you say in that Chinese uh, bamboo or whatever it is, I see it where people are planting that stuff, and that stuff is so invasive. It just oh, it spreads is. Spreads it is. And it it's is. Like man, we don't like that. Yeah. Well, you know, I had it. I, I, it's not around me, luckily, but it's. I've seen it up the road yeah. here. Somebody put it alongside the road, and yeah. Um, then there's some other places it's growing. Yeah. Well, so. My bees are all over it, and they're filling up my honey super. So, yeah, I shouldn't take it away from them, but I got pro sweet baby. I so. If I'd have been smart enough 10 years ago, I'd have put, planted a couple of BB trees. They'd have been. Then you'd really have spotted lanternflies. Yeah. Because yeah, <laughs> that's their natural food source. Oh, yeah. 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 Oh my gosh, I got to tell you, I was out at the fairgrounds the other day. There's a little dinky restaurant up there at the grandstand. And uh, we were coming down the steps and we stopped. The railing going down the middle of the staircase was covered in spotted lanternfly. I mean, covered all on top of each other. And I thought, oh my God, what are they after? And I thought, you know what? They probably came in on the fair equipment, on all the trucks. And, you know, the horses are going to be coming in and all the vans and everything. They're, they're just, they're going to be spreading them all over the place. But they, it, I took my shoe off, my flip-flop, and I'm bashing the hell out of these things. And, I mean, they jump fast, too. But, oh, my God, they were just horrible. And I only lived like a half a mile from the fair, or about a mile from the fairgrounds. And I just thought, well, they're in my neighborhood. They are all in my neighborhood, but not at the farm where I keep my bees so far. Well, two in the pool, but that's all I've seen. So, but uh, Last year, we had a bunch of them here. And this year, we've only seen a couple so far. Really? Last year, you told me that the um, praying mantis... We're catching them and eating them too, weren't you? Yep. Yep. And see, you know, the the, the big praying mantis is a Chinese invasive praying mantis. So the Chinese pr- invasive praying mantis probably saw the spotted lantern flies from China and said, oh, Yay! We got goodies. <laughs> they went crazy. So I used to I used to get rid of the Chinese praying mantis. Now I let them go because I figure, well, if they're going to eat them, let them. Well, they- they also eat stink bugs. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Another plus. <laughs> What's that? I said another plus. Yes, they another plus. Bugs. Exactly. Yeah. As long as they eat the Chinese, the invasive Chinese things, I don't care. Go ahead. You know. Of course, the praying mantis will probably be that big. You know, it'll be eating birds before long. So. Well, we have a ton of them around here. I don't know where they all come from, but. Yeah. We have oodles of them. Yeah. And now I see on the internet 
where they got this new invasive bee that they found. A hornet, yeah. California or someplace. No, Savannah. Yeah, Georgia. The yellow-legged hornet. Yeah. And that's uh, yes. um, right in the middle of bee country down there. Yep. Charlie, I have a quick question for you. You were talking yeah. about um, putting something I, I'm assuming you mean underneath your string bottom board that you're putting the wedges and the corrugated board is that correct yeah well that's it's core plast is what it is it's plastic sign board plastic car it's it looks like cardboard but it's made out of plastic right but you're not putting it on top of your string bottom board you're putting it under it yeah because mine has um, little slides as you slide oh, okay. it in. okay it's kind of like it's uh, back in the day with IPM board you know in her Right. That's management board. Same thing. I just yeah. put the wedges in there to jam it up tight so it try to keep as much vapor inside that box as possible. Okay. Yeah, all. Jane, if you're running screen bottom boards and they don't have the slot in them, you can use the same chloroplast and trim it to fit to slide in on the bottom board, okay, and be able to have a wedge in the front to hold the front down and be able to shoot the uh, OA vapor. OA vapors into it from either a vapor or do it. You wouldn't be able to use the uh, the pan type because the pan gets hot. Right. And right. we just burn through the core palace. Okay. Thank you. I just wanted to make sure I understood what you were doing. Yeah. Thank well, you. What, what are you using, Jane? So I, I don't have the slots. Um, I do have a piece of hard plastic that I slide on top of my screens and then I have the OA um, gun that I put through the bottom board. I have a hole in the bottom board that I use the vapor that way. But I just wanted to make sure I understood what you Same were doing. Same thing. Yeah, it'll yeah. work. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. I had one last thing. I talked to Sybil this week and there's some new um, regulation that's going around to any beekeeper that is keeping bees on property that is not their own property and you have to go through um, a pesticides training and especially if you have guys work if you have beaks working for you so you have to go through a comprehensive pesticide training it's not on the books yet she doesn't have it set up yet but any of us and I have guys working for me um, that have people working for you and also have hives on property you do not own. You need to go through a comprehensive pesticide training. It's nothing that we don't already know. Um, and it's like a self-guided thing, but um, just be, be aware, any of us on this group, there's gonna be a notice coming out probably in the next couple months. How much does it cost to do this? It's free, it's oh, all free. Oh, okay, I thought it was another way for Maryland to earn some money. <laughs> no, it's free. It's, free. It's, like, it's like the spotted lantern flight training that they, okay. if you export any bees out of state, you have to take that. And it's all free, but just to let you guys know. Okay, appreciate it. Yeah, for, for the pesticides though, after you take the course, do you have to get licensed as a pesticide applicator on somebody no. else's property? No. Because no. that's where the money comes in, is in the app, <laughs> right. license. Oh. No. Right. It is not, but it is just to make you aware. Basically, the label, if they're going to drill in your head, the label is the law, which we already know. Yeah. Which the label already told us. Exactly. <laughs> See, I, I think of beekeepers as being the most responsible people handling pesticides because if we mishandle you, it, we're you killed. You are totally wrong. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you yeah, I like, I like uh, what Randy Oliver says, you know, oh, you can put anything in your hive as long as long as it's for the well-being of the hive, but not to be, but you can't put anything in the hive unless it's labeled if you're trying to kill a mite. Think about it. When, when I used, this is a few years ago now, I went down to Georgia to pick up package bees. And every spring that I went down to pick up package bees, the commercial beekeepers were riding around with the newest treatment that there was available for mites that they dreamed up. <laughs> uh, Apistan, the active ingredient, is fluvalinate. Most of the guys down there were squirting the milk of life 
uh, onto the bottom board of the colony. Oh dear. Which was a 50% wettable powder mixed in a garden sprayer that you shook up when you finished working the yard. You shook the sprayer up and you walked through and squirted some in on the each hive's bottom board. Oh my gosh. Uh, another time I went down and the latest thing with a pasteboard strip about two inches wide and about eight inches long and you soaked it in a insecticide that was used on cotton called Robison. Killed mites deader in hell. <sighs> and they had killed a bunch of bees too, but what did it do to the honey? Yeah. Oh. Uh, they weren't necessarily worried about the honey because they were selling package bees. Mm. Okay. But it's, it's just- Strike and, that. <laughs> you know, it, it, and in some ways you can't blame them when somebody has 5,000 colonies to treat and it costs them six or seven dollars a colony to do a treatment and it's a strip and they have to have they have to buy the strips they have to pay an employee to put the strip in 42 days later they have to pay the employee to go and pull the strip out of the colony to follow the regulations right and it's all about the money yeah just like it is with the state of Maryland. It's all about the money. All about the money. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> well, okay. Well, as far as, you know, money and bees, as far as the state of Maryland, we're, we're pretty, being very, we don't cost us anything. You go to Pennsylvania, you're getting charged by the hive. Oh, really? Up there. And if you want to process honey, you better have a inspected kitchen. And in, you know, in a honey house, and you know, like a health department where you have to have a wash basin and all this other. I mean, we're we're non-regulated compared to them places. Mm, okay. Well, that's not necessarily true. <laughs> I'm regulated. Um, we just completed an FDA inspection of our honey packaging facility where it's a requirement that you be registered with the FDA if you sell honey wholesale for retail sale. And we do that. And as a result, we periodically get an unannounced inspection, which is always a thrill. <laughs> I've been involved with, I was employed by a defense contractor previous to this, where we had to undergo defense contractor inspections. We also were ISO certified, so we had to go through ISO certification inspections. We were being inspected continuously, early, often, and all the time. Uh, and it was always interesting, and with the FDA inspection, it's much the same thing. Do not say anything. When they ask a question, you try your best to answer yes or no. Offer no embellishment. That will come back to haunt you. Mm. <laughs> but anyway, we went through it. We passed. We were okie dokie for another couple of years. That's good. Very good. Well, it's 9.05. Well, I'm going to say good night. Okay. All right, Bill. I am too. Good night, everybody. Thank you for joining in, and um, we'll see you in the funny papers. Good uh, night, all. Good night, all. Yeah. <laughs>